Hello, and welcome to Retro Tech Repair. Sometimes when I'm recording a video, I have one of those days where nothing goes right. Today is one of those examples. What I thought was going to be a simple repair turned out to be a lot more complicated than I ever anticipated. This is the Casio VL1. Let's get it repaired and see how it plays. I saw this on eBay. I paid what I think is a great price for it, but I happened to notice on the listing that, yeah, it's... It suffered some battery thermal corrosion there, and in fact, the battery compartment is, is pretty nasty. But it looks like the actual contacts are intact. So it's gonna be interesting to see if there's any damage inside of this. So before we put some batteries into this, let's take a brief look at the eBay listing. And as you admire my beautifully manicured nails, you can see that I paid just three pounds for this, plus 3.95 shipping. I think a good price for a Casio VL Tone, if I can get it working. Here's how the seller described it. Vintage Casio VL Tone VL1 electronic keyboard, computer synthesizer calculator. Condition is for parts, not working. So first of all, let's just pop some batteries in and see if, like the seller said, it doesn't work. Indeed. Very accurate description. Completely dead. So let's try cleaning up these battery terminals just quickly to see if we can get something that works. And then if we can, we'll go ahead and clean them up properly. So I have these little brushes. We have a fiberglass brush and a brass brush and a steel brush. I think I'm probably just gonna go with the brass one for this, I think. A little spring there's just a bit tricky because it's just moving as I'm trying to clean it. Right, let's see if that fixed our problem. Well, yes and no. You see this display did come up. So now it's working, but it doesn't make any noise. None of the rhythms work, it just seems to be dead. So let's try a quick reset, given that it's had all this battery trauma. We'll pop a, something in there just to reset that. And still nothing. Oh, it's in calculator. There we go, that's probably the problem. Nope, that wasn't the problem. Even in play, no noise. In fact, even when we turn it off, the display stays on. So obviously, this has problems other than the battery terminal. So that's good. Uh, now I have something to repair, which is more than just battery corrosion. So that's a good thing. Let's take a look and see if we can figure out what's going on. There we are, good. So looking inside here for the first time, zoom in a little bit. And we have our battery contacts here, uh, which are much cleaner obviously inside, but we know that we have battery voltage going in. Uh, we have a bunch of electrolytic capacitors, although initially I don't see anything that's bulging or broken or anything like that. A few transistors with some diodes, maybe that's for reverse polarity protection. Uh, our line out for the audio, and this looks to be a pot, but it's, does that connect to the back? No, that doesn't go through to the back. So that whatever that is, that's not the tuning pot. There's some kind of potentiometer there. There's another potentiometer here. And then there's this one, which actually is the one that's for the tuning of the keyboard. That's the one that is accessed through the back. So the first thing I'm going to do, just in case that is significant, is I'm just gonna give these a few wipes, just in case it's making noise, but we can't hear it. And I'm going to give these a few swipes, just in case they are oxidized too. I notice that quite conveniently, this board is marked with the parts. I don't know if you can see that, but the board is marked with the parts. So the part numbers are actually marked on the board. So you can see the value of everything that's in there. Uh, certainly it looks like this capacitor has had some trauma or some description. It's left some deposit or something on the board there, as has this one. Um, these ceramic disc capacitors uh, are unusual to have those fail. I have seen them fail, but normally they're not too bad. Electrolytics are more suspect, but those do look kind of 
grimy. I don't know why they would be that way, but, but maybe we can take them out and stick them in the tester and see. On the top half, uh, I think we have here some kind of IC. This looks like it might be the amplifier circuitry. Uh, this might be the IC that does all the work. It's anonymous, at least from this side of the board. I don't see anything marked on there. Connections to the speaker seem to be intact. Hard to tell for sure, but we'll have a little test of that later as well. And in the meantime, let's just pop our batteries in one more time, see if any of our twisting and turning of our pots here has had any positive effect. Oh, there's some noise. What you probably won't pick up on the camera is there is some hiss. There's definitely an audible hiss from the from the keyboard. Let's try this reset again. That doesn't seem to have any effect. I'm assuming it's a reset. Nothing. Well, maybe we do have a battery problem. Let's try it on a bench power supply with a connection via this DC jack input. Okay, so just out of shot here, I have my bench power supply. We can zoom out and show you that right here. And back in. And uh, it's hooked up now to provide a DC voltage at six volts, it's uh, four times one and a half, uh, six volts, and in fact, the behavior is exactly the same. The calculator part comes up. I don't even know if the calculator bit works. Uh, no, that doesn't seem to work. When I switch off the power, it goes away. When I switch on the power, it comes back. But as you can see, it's, it's not working at all. The calculator isn't working. There's no sound at all. So at this point, I decided to separate the electronics from the plastics in order to give myself more room when I'm trying to diagnose the problem with the VL1. So here we are inside our Casio VL1. And a couple of things struck me as being interesting when I started to take a look around the board. The first thing is that these two capacitors here seem to have suffered some kind of trauma. I don't know why they would look like that out of the factory, but they're covered in some kind of white deposit and there's some kind of white deposit on the board. Um, one other thing that I did notice you're probably not going to be able to see that too well. I'm going to try and lift this up now. But there is some solder from that one connector that's bridging two tracks. So we're definitely going to go ahead and clean that up. And then finally, the thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and check the transistors on this board. Okay, so we're going to go through our transistor chain now and we're going to test each of them. So we have a multimeter set to diode test. And we're going to start out with this one. It says it's a 2SA715, it's actually not. B698 is the part number of the actual part. Nonetheless, uh, I do believe it's an NPN transistor. So I didn't do a very good job of explaining myself when I was filming the video, so I thought I'd do a voiceover to try and explain myself instead. We're using diode test on the multimeter because a diode is made up of a PN junction, where P is positively doped semiconductor and N is the negatively doped semiconductor. A bipolar transistor is made up of three similar layers, either PNP or NPN. Those three layers are labeled emitter, base or collector. So we can use the diode test function to look for diode-like performance between either emitter and base or base and collector. And the type of bipolar transistor, PNP or NPN, determines whether we put our positive lead on the base or our negative lead on the base when we're doing those tests. It all sounds really complicated, but it really isn't. And if you'd like to see more, there's plenty of videos on YouTube that explain transistor testing. Or you could take a look at my Tommy Munchman video where I go over transistor testing in more detail. And to be honest, I could do with the views on that video too. But it really doesn't make any difference because none of the transistors were faulty in our VL1 and they were not the cause of our problem. So all of these transistors tested in circuit test out just fine. So I think the thing for me to do next is to clean off that track that we saw that was bridged here, get these two caps switched out. Okay, so I'm just gonna see if I can scratch off this little track, if this little bit of solder splatter. If not, we'll have to get the soldering iron on it. 
On the face of it at least, that seems to have come away without too much of a problem. So now I remove the solder from the ceramic capacitors using my desoldering tool. Of course you could do this using a soldering iron and a standard soldering pump, but these desoldering tools are so affordable now that if you're going to be doing a lot of work it's probably worth buying one of these anyway. Now looking at the capacitors that I've removed, that deposit which seemed to have formed on them while they were in the keyboard now seems to have gone. When I test them in the component tester, everything tests just fine. But we'll probably go ahead and replace them anyway because they're so cheap that it really isn't worth soldering the old parts back into the board. So put everything back together. Well, I temporarily sat the things together that I think needed to be in place. And I connected it up to my bench power supply here. And I turned it on and you'll be pleased to hear that it made no difference whatsoever. And in fact, all the keys have now dropped out because I didn't hold it properly in place as I tipped it over. Uh, but it doesn't work. It's just the same as before. I just get a zero on the display, no sound, no activity from the keyboard. Can't use it as a calculator. Can't use it for anything at all. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna take a moment to think about my next steps and then we'll see where those take us. Okay, so I've decided that what I'm going to do is I'm going to reinstall this top board back into the top of the unit here, uh, just to give it some stability just mechanical stability as I'm working around it here. I need these switches to be operational in order to be able to test it. So I'm going to have to be lifting it in and out all the time anyway. So I think it makes more sense for me to just reassemble it at least temporarily, just so I don't risk damaging the display cable or the speaker cables whilst I'm doing the diagnostic on the rest of the board. All right, so having failed to find anything wrong with the transistors, uh, having cleaned off the track and had no effect, I think I've just decided I'm going to go ahead and recap this. If you see my other videos, you'll know I don't like to just routinely replace parts. I'm really more interested in doing a little bit for the environment, not throwing away things that are good, but I don't know what's wrong with it. So I think the best thing to do now is just for me to recap it. At least then I'll know the capacitors weren't the problem and I'll be able to look elsewhere on the board to try and find what the problem is. Okay, so that's all of my electrolytic capacitors now replaced by nice new shiny electrolytic capacitors with the exception of this one uh, which has no polarity on it. So this is a, uh, a bi-directional, I'm not quite sure what the phrase is, bi-directional electrolytic so it can be connected either way around. Each of these others has a positive and a negative. I didn't have another one of these. I did take it out and I put it in my tester. It appears to work. So did all of these by the way. All the ones that I removed appeared to work as well. And of course, when I plug this in and I try out our Casio, it's still not working. It's doing exactly what it did before. So clearly that wasn't the problem, but I suppose at least it's got new caps now. So if I ever do fix this, then uh, the electrolytic shouldn't be a problem for a while. All right, so quite a lot of time has passed since I last paused the video and I've been quite busy. What I've done is I've bridged the switch just with a couple of jumper wires there so I don't have to mess around with the switch. And when I bridge these switches, I bridge these to be in play mode. And then I bridge this one to be in piano and this one to be in one of the octaves. It doesn't really matter which. Uh, but I bridged each of those three switches. And so although this is in play mode, what's interesting is that when I connect this up, even though this is wired to be play, it still thinks it's a calculator. When I use it as a calculator, some of the buttons still work, but a lot of them don't work. So what I did then was I wrote down on this pad which ones worked and which ones didn't. And I'm trying to figure out exactly what the kind of matrix of keys is. And my theory is that perhaps somewhere up here, some of the signals which are going into the processor aren't making it back. Now they could not be making it back because of a fault on the printed circuit board, or they could be making it back, but there'd be a fault on the processor. Nonetheless, my theory as to why we're stuck in calculator mode is something to do with the signals going across this board. So this one, I've kind of said, okay, well, I'm okay with that one now. I think this board works. I'm looking at this board now. I think it's worth me spending a little bit more time doing this. And then in addition to that, I've also been trying to map out this microprocessor. Now the microprocessor is a D1867G. I can't find any information on that. So I'm trying to draw that out also and where some of the connections are and how they connect to this connector, which goes off to the board. So I'm going to carry on with that and then I'll come back when I've found something out. So I thought at this stage, it might be interesting just to show you the state of my workbench, which is an absolute mess and talk you very quickly through the things that I've been doing. I've been trying to work out what's going on with this keyboard matrix. So I have a drawing here. It shows each of the keys on the VL1 and it shows each of the pins that they are mapped to on the processor. I also 
have backwards engineered this printed circuit assembly. And from that, I have the schematic for that printed circuit assembly. It's a bit rough, but it gives you an idea. Uh, these pins here, I'll go up to the LCD. There's not much going on there. These pins go through two potentiometers and a 56K resistor. They're the tuning. There's a permanent plus three volts at each side here on pins 26 and 58. And um, the keyboard matrix is mapped on pins three to 19, as we see here. These are the connectors that go off to the main board. There's two grounds. There's one permanent plus three volts. Uh, this line here is a control from the microprocessor to enable the audio circuit. Uh, this pin, I think, is audio out 63. And I think 64 is some kind of balance control, or it might be a separate audio out for the rhythm and the accompaniment. I don't know. Uh, but that's basically it. Uh, just ignore what's written in the middle here. I'm probably going to try and redraw this at some future time. Unfortunately, though, there's still a problem. I'm going to show you very quickly what that is. The microcontroller, I assume, sends a signal out on 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 repeatedly. And it looks for where it comes back. So if it sends a signal out on 11 and it comes back on line 10, then it knows that, that corresponding button has been pressed. As it switches one on, it's looking to see if anything's coming back on these lines. Then it switches the next one on and it looks to see if anything's coming back on those lines. Anyway, when I do that, I see that there's a signal going out on all of these pins, as you would expect. That's the signal that's going out on these pins here, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, to the keyboard. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, we'll have outgoing signal. 17, no signal. 18, no signal. 19, no signal. So I have in my matrix, I have a signal going out on 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, but no signal going out on 17, no signal going out on 18, and no signal going out on 19. When I look at what those correspond to on my diagram, I see that 17, 18, and 19 relate to the instrument selection, the function selection, so play, record, or calculator, uh, or the octave selection. So because there's no signal going out, when the processor sends something out on one of these channels, it doesn't see anything back. It doesn't know which of these are selected, and therefore it probably goes into a default calculator mode. Now, as I continue to waffle on, I think what I'm trying to explain is that we've determined that the processor in our Casio VL1 is defective. And as you'll know, if you watch this channel, I don't usually post videos where I can't make a repair. So although I can't buy the parts I need off the shelf, we are going to get this fixed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the schematics up for a little while in the hope that they'll be useful to somebody else. And in the meantime, I'm going to ask a favor. I don't make any money from these repairs and I don't have enough subscribers or view time on YouTube to commercialize the videos. So I don't make any money on the videos either. So if you're enjoying the video today, please comment, like, share, and subscribe. And if you're not enjoying the video, please give me a big thumbs down and tell me what I can do differently next time. In the meantime, let's return to the repair of our Casio VL1. Now, unfortunately, in the old VO1 that we were repairing, I concluded that, in fact, the main IC, the main processor chip, was at fault. And unfortunately, there's no real easy way for me to repair that. But what I did do is I did a little bit of research online, and I found that there are other keyboards which use the same processor. And that perhaps some of those are a little bit more affordable than the Casio VL1. So, I decided to buy on eBay another Casio keyboard, which is supposedly fully working, and see if I could use that, transplant the contents of it into the VL1. Now, yeah, a bit controversial perhaps, to take a, what we hope is a fully working keyboard, and put the parts into a keyboard that's broken. Now, why would I do that? Well, in the VL1, the VL1 has an attack decay sustain release function. It has a calculator function. It has an additional sound. So if these chips are the same and they have the same programming, then when we put it into the VL1, we'll enable the chip that's in here to hopefully 
fulfill its true potential and have those features which it wasn't able to do in this, I must say, rather cute little Casio PT10. So let's pop some batteries into this and see if it works. Seems to work. So it looks like just five screws, maybe six. It looks like there's one in the battery compartment to secure this to the base. Uh, I do see the chip. It's right there. I don't see any markings on it. I see the kind of telltale battery corrosion. I've, I think I've yet to find a Casio keyboard that doesn't have some level of that. And I don't think it's anything to do with the design uh, other than perhaps that uh, the battery compartment is hidden. So uh, you do slide the batteries in. This area here is hidden, sitting right above the processor. It's all this kind of rusty unpleasantness. So let's have a look, see if this chip actually has the same part number as the one in the VL1 that we were looking at before. As I remember the VL tone, I think most of the pins on the top part of the chip were driving the display. So I'd expect to see uh, probably from kind of three quarters of the way up each side and all the way around the top would have no connection if in fact this was the same chip. So here we seem to have an NEC D1867G. There are some extra numbers on it. Not the same as the numbers on the other one, I don't think, 874WK. Uh, we'll bring out the VL1 in a minute and we'll take a look at what that is. But it looks like we might have the same chip here. So here we have our PT10 outside of its case with its D1867G processor. And then here we have our Casio VL tone also with this D1867G processor. As we had thought, the pins that normally would drive the display on the VL1 are not connected on this. Some of the other pins aren't connected as well because this has slightly fewer functions. Then I think that this processor is certainly going to be worth switching over into this board. I've never done any surface mount before. So it's going to be interesting, uh, a new experience for me. But I think since this works, the right thing to do would be to try and get the chip out of the VL tone first. I don't really know what I'm doing, but I think getting it out of there first, since that doesn't work anyway, if I mess that process up, then, well, not great, uh, but it doesn't work right now. Whereas if I mess taking it out of here up first off, then, um, well, you know, I've broken two keyboards and that wouldn't be really what we were aiming for at all. So better to go for the VL1 first. So what I'm trying to do now is get some heat insulation protection around this so that I can go in with the hot air gun and try and loosen this chip. I notice this isn't capped on tape. Capped on, of course, is a brand name, but as luck would have it, I managed to, on Amazon, buy some, some cop tan tape, which I'm sure is just as good. So now I have capped on tape, cop tan tape, heat resistant tape, protecting all of the things around here. I've also put some kitchen foil cut around the part just to provide some extra heat protection there. And I've held that in place in a couple of places with some capped on tape. I'm now going to try and heat up this with a hot air gun, see if I can get this chip free. So at this point in the video, I think it makes sense to mention a couple of things. Firstly, I did put additional heat resistant tape all around the IC, but you can't see it now because I've covered it with the foil. Second, in case you need any further reminder, I don't know what I'm doing at all. This is the first surface mount job that I've ever done and I'll probably make a complete mess of it. Please don't consider this instruction. I wonder if I should have put some flux on here or something first. So this painful video of me slowly circulating around the chip with the hot air gun went on for about two minutes. In reality, it probably would have taken much less time than that to melt the solder. I was looking for the solder to start to glisten or something like that like I'd seen on other videos, but it didn't. So let's pick it up at the point where I realised that I'd been heating it up for too long. Oh, it's loose. It's already loose. See if I can get in there and move it. All right. 
but you can see now that I have got that off it's come off pretty intact uh, nice it obviously I held the heat on there longer than I needed to which is a shame uh, but uh, it's experience I suppose I'm gonna take now our heat screen off because in fact I intend to hand solder this back in place so I'm hoping that everything around survived okay and I don't know if hand soldering is the best way to install the new chip or the replacement chip. I'm just hoping that this LCD su survived the whole experience. Oh. Well, it looks like I've lifted a track on the LCD panel with my capped on tape. Oh no. Yeah, I definitely lost a, a track there. I don't know which one it was, but maybe I should play another piece of tape more precisely there and hope that it rescues our display. Okay, so I put some tape on here. I'm hoping that the actual conductor is intact. It felt like maybe it was just uh, the, the plastic or something that had come away and that the conductor was intact. I'm hoping that's the case. I don't know, we'll see. What I'm going to do in the meantime is I'm just going to come in with my soldering iron and just smooth out some of these pads where the, uh, where the old chip was so that the new chip sits neatly in place. So having cleaned those up a little bit now, I'm going to try and remove the chip from the other keyboard. And the process of removal is just the same, except this time I'm not quite as worried about the surrounding components because I don't intend to preserve this board. And uh, of course I've put a little bit of flux on this time in the hope that uh, that might help the removal process. And I am going to be a little bit more attentive to the status of it as I'm removing it in case I can get it to come off sooner without having to apply more heat. So the jinx of the Casio VL1 struck again and the audio that I had originally recorded with this portion of the video was ridiculously crackly. What's more, I realized this after the recording of the original voiceover for this video, and so consequently the acoustics of this portion are different to the rest. Anyway, excuses aside, all that I'm doing now is cleaning off the pins with my soldering iron and then cleaning off the residual flux with some IPA on a cotton bud. So now we have our replacement IC. I'm going to try and solder it by hand into the board. I'm not massively optimistic, but we'll see how it goes. Well, at this point in the video, it pains me to have to tell you that in fact, it didn't go very well at all. Not because the hand soldering was particularly difficult, but because somehow I failed to record it on the video. When I came to edit this video, I came back to look for the clip of me soldering the part to the board, and unfortunately, it was nowhere to be found. So instead, I'm just going to have to describe to you what I did. Initially, I tried a drag solder technique where you drag a large blob of solder across all of the pins and rely on the solder mass to separate the solder between each of them. Unfortunately, this didn't work for me, and all that happened was I managed to solder all of the pins together. So I cleaned everything up and started again. And this time, I heated each pin in turn and applied a thin piece of solder to the junction between the pin and the pad. I repeated this for each of the pins and eventually got all the way around the chip and was relatively successful. As you can see from the stills, it's far from a perfect job. The pins aren't perfectly lined up on the left hand side and it could look much cleaner, but I do think I got a basic electrical connection between each pin and each pad. So now that we have our IC replaced, the next thing for us to do is to reassemble the Casio in order for us to be able to test it. I start by unsoldering the temporary solder bridges that I'd put across each of the switches. <laughs> and then I reinstalled the rubber and carbon pill sections that go behind the push buttons and the keypad. With the switch mechanisms now in place, I can assemble the digital printed circuit assembly back into the top half of the plastic enclosure of the keyboard. With that done, I can now connect up a DC power supply and perform a quick test of the functions of the keyboard before final assembly. So, well, the good news is that it's off. So when it's switched off, it's immediately off. Of course, it could mean it doesn't work at all. Let's try it to calculator. Great. So the calculator seems to come up. Let's see if it works this time. Some of the buttons that didn't before. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the calculator seems to work. Let's go straight to play and try some of the sounds. Piano. Brilliant. Fantasy. Violin. 
flute. And now the sound that the PT-10 didn't have, guitar. Well, it's not it doesn't sound anything like a guitar, but it does sound like it's implemented and then attack, decay, sustain, release. And then uh, the famous rhythms. So it looks like our Casio VL1 is fully repaired and we've proven that you can transfer the chip from a lesser keyboard, in this case the Casio PT10, into a VL1 and get all of the functionality that the lesser keyboard didn't have. Of course I had to destroy the PT10 in the process and some would say well what's the point of that? But I think it's been an interesting exercise to see what this little chip can do when you transfer it from the smaller keyboard into one which gives it more scope in the form of ADSR, a calculator function and of course the guitar sound. So all that remains now is for us to reassemble our Casio VL Tone VL1 and I'll leave it to play its demo tune until the end of the video. If you've made it this far into the video I'd just like to say thank you very much. This has been a difficult video for me to make and has been plagued with production problems, including missing video footage and noise on the audio. Nonetheless, I do think it was an interesting repair. I've learned some new skills as we've gone through and I hope that you've enjoyed the video. So if you'd like to see more videos like this, perhaps with better production, please click like, share and subscribe. And in the meantime, thank you so much for watching Retro Tech Repair.